open your Bibles with me to Judges chapter 9. Judges chapter 9, and what an exciting book study. You know, there are a lot of pastors that uh, would be afraid to teach this rated R book from the Old Testament because it's so violent and explicit in that way. But my goodness, it has been a blessing to us, hasn't it? God's Word speaks into our lives. Judges chapter 9, by way of introduction, Gideon lived to an old age and died. And he had all of these sons, all these different towns all across, all across Israel. And, uh, but the children of Israel didn't remember the Lord, and they didn't remember and show kindness to Gideon and his family. And chapter 9 begins with one of Gideon's sons, Abimelech. Judges chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. You follow along as I read out loud. It says, Then Abimelech, the son of Jerubbabel, and that was the nickname they gave Gideon, went to Shechem to his mother's brothers and spoke with them and with all the family of the house of his mother's brothers, saying, Please speak in the hearing of all the men of Shechem. Which is better for you that all 70 of the sons of Jerubbabel reign over you, or that one reign over you. Remember that I am your own flesh and bone. And his mother's brothers spoke all these words concerning him in the hearing of all the men of Shechem. And their heart was inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, he's our brother. So they gave him 70 shekels of silver from the temple of Baal Berith, with which Abimelech hired worthless and reckless men, kind of bounty hunter type of fellows, right? And they followed him. Well, then he went to his father's house at Ophrah and killed his brothers, the 70 sons of Jerubbabel, on one stone. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubbabel, was left because he hid himself. And all the men of Shechem gathered together, all of Beth Milo, and they went and made Abimelech king beside the terebinth tree at the pillar that was in Shechem. So as we've read these verses now, Abimelech isn't con content to be a son of Gideon. He wasn't a judge. Scripture doesn't call him a judge. You know, the word judge in Hebrew means a, a rescuer, a, a deliverer, a savior, if you will. And he's not that. He's, he's a son but he's not content to be a son. He isn't called a judge. He wants complete control. He wants to be king. As a matter of fact, his name, Abimelech, means my father was king. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because Gideon, they tried to make him king, and he said, I don't want that job. I don't want to rule over you. I don't want that kind of position over you. I want to rescue you, but I don't want to rule you. And so he has this name, my father was king, and he's going he, he's gonna to try and exploit the people. So he goes to um, his mother's side of the family, and he makes a deal. And they give him a lot of money to purchase a little army, and he goes to Ophrah, which is his dad's hometown, and he kills all of his brothers except for the youngest, a, a kid by the name of Jotham. Verse 7, now when they told Jotham, he went and stood on top of Mount Gerizim and lifted his voice and cried out. And he said to them, listen to me, you men of Shechem, that God may listen to you. The trees once went forth to anoint a king over them. And they said to the olive tree, reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, should I cease giving my oil with which they honor God and men and go to sway over trees? Well, then the tree said to the fig tree, you come and reign over us. But the fig tree said to them, should I cease my sweetness and my good fruit and go to sway over trees? Then the tree said to the vine, you come and reign over us. But the vine said to them, should I cease my new wine, which cheers both God and men and go to sway over trees? Well, then all the trees said to the bramble, you come and reign over us. And a bramble, by the way, is an old scrub bush, right? And the bramble said to the trees, verse 15, 
if in truth you anoint me as king over you, then come and take shelter in my shade. But if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. So Jotham, he gets on top of Mount Gerizim and the valley below. That's where he waits until all the people are down there. And then he shouts out this parable. Shouts out a parable about how worthless and a low life his half-brother um, Abimelech has been. And the parable reveals that Gideon and his 70 sons were pictured as the olive tree, the big tree, and the vine. But notice that the first three, they wisely refused to leave their God-ordained, God-appointed places of usefulness in order to go and reign over the trees. They said, no, well, no, we can't. I, I, no, I'm, I'm supposed to produce olives. No, I'm supposed to produce figs. I'm supposed to produce grapes and wine. And I can't leave what God gave to me to go and just rule over people. But the bramble, it was not only eager to become king, but it warned that it would destroy all the cedars of Lebanon if the trees didn't elect him as king. And so Jotham shouts this from the top of Mount Gerizim. And it's kind of a prophecy and it's kind of a curse at the same time. Do you see that? So let's read on. Let's see what happens next. Verse 16, now therefore, if you have acted in truth and sincerity in making Abimelech king, and if you have dealt well with Jerubbabel and his house and have done to him as he deserves, for my father fought for you, risked his life, and delivered you out of the hand of Midian, but you have risen up against my father's house this day, and killed his 70 sons on one stone and made Abimelech the son of his female servant king over the men of Shechem because he is your brother. If then you have acted in truth and sincerity with Jerubbabel and with his house this day, then rejoice in Abimelech and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come uh, from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and Beth Milo and let fire come from the men of Shechem and from Beth Milo and devour Abimelech. And Jotham ran away and fled and he went to Beer and dwelt there for fear of Abimelech, his brother. So he says in these verses, listen, if you've done the right thing, then everybody's going to rejoice over this new king. But if you guys have done wickedly, this is going to end in civil war. You guys are going to end up killing one another. And guys, that's exactly what is about to happen. Look at verse 22. After Abimelech had reigned over Israel three years. A lot can change in three years, wouldn't you agree? Doesn't this church look a lot different from three years ago? I'm talking about that with some folks this morning. Three years, everything can change. God sent a spirit of ill will between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. And the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. That the crime done to the 70 sons of Jerubbabel might be settled and their blood be laid on Abimelech, their brother, who killed them, and on the men of Shechem, who aided him in the killing of his brothers. And the men of Shechem set men in ambush against him on the tops of the mountains, and they robbed all who passed by them along that way, and it was told to uh, uh, it was told to Abimelech. So, uh, the very thing that was prophesied begins to take place, right? Because it's a crooked little deal that was made with crooked people. You can't trust crooked people, right? If you have some way of making something happen under the table, it, it can't end well because you you're dealing with things in a crooked way. See what happens next, verse 26. Now Gaal, the son of Ebed, came with his brothers and went over to Shechem. And the men of Shechem put their confidence in him. So they went out into the fields and gathered grapes from their vineyards and trod them and made merry. And they went into the house of their God and they ate and drank and cursed Abimelech. And that's kind of how people get all drunk. They start boasting and bragging and speaking against the government, speaking against their leaders, right? Isn't that kind of the way of things? Then Gaal, the son of Ebed, said, Who is Abimelech? And who is Shechem that we should serve him? Is he not the son of Jerubbabel, and is not Zebul his officer? Serve the men of Hamor, uh, the father of Shechem, 
but why should we serve him? If only this people were under my authority, then I would remove Abimelech. So he said to Abimelech, increase your army and come out. So Gaal is bragging, right? He's kind of getting cocky now that he's had a few glasses of wine or whatever. And, and he's not afraid of Abimelech, of Abimelech here. He, I put it in my notes this way. Nobody likes a braggart. Isn't that the, isn't that the truth? I mean, does anybody in here like a braggart? And sometimes we pastors can be the absolute worst in this. You know, we present illustrations from our own lives to be examples of how everyone should be. You know, I was in this grocery store, and I was talking to this person in front of me, and I shared the gospel with them, and, that, and people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure that happens to you all the time, Pastor Philip, right? Years ago, I was just a couple of years into the ministry, and uh, an old high school friend of mine found out that Philip Friendsley had become a pastor, and he was shocked because of the kind of guy I'd been, and he just had to see it with his own eyes, right? And so he came to this school where we were meeting in, in, in Tennessee, and after the service, he, he shared what had happened in his life. He had been the single adult pastor at a very large, prominent Baptist church in Nashville, Tennessee. He had married the pretty girl in the singles department of 450 singles in this mega church, right? And it looked like they had this storybook kind of a, a wedding and marriage and life and all of this, but she was unfaithful. She left him, and he became very bitter, and, and he dropped out of church. And I said, Greg, why did you drop out of your church? He said, well, when my life came crashing down, he said, I just couldn't go back one more Sunday and hear the pastor talk about his perfect life, his perfect family, his perfect dog, his perfect golf swing, you know, all those sports metaphors that pastors, you know. He said, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't hear any more of that. And he dropped out of church for about a year. Right? Now he's come back to the Lord and found himself a place where God's word is being taught in truth and grace and mercy. But when he shared that with me all those years ago, I thought, yeah, Lord, I, I don't have this thing figured out. I, I'm as faulty as you guys in as many ways as you guys are. I am not the poster child for Christianity sitting up here. I, I, I mean, I'm just figuring things out as well as you guys are. As a matter of fact, um, I think this is why the media has a field day when a pastor sins publicly. They like to stick it to us guys because we act like we've got it together so often, right? In light of this, I was thinking about, oh, it's, it's been a lot of years ago now, but I was a pastor when this happened. I just, I'm going to warn you in advance. My best friend, Michael Hunter, back in Tennessee, he and I used to play basketball on Sunday nights at a park near where the church met. And it was, we saw it as kind of an outreach. We played three on three against some guys in a little half court game. And, and uh, we started bringing Gatorade and stuff like that. We just handed out to whoever wanted a Gatorade and, and try and, you know, share our faith with them after, after the ball game and everything. But this one particular afternoon, it was kind of an overcast day, it looked like rain, and not a lot of folks showed up. We finally got three guys to play us. One of them was a father and son, and they had a buddy with them. And we're playing three on three, and the father chose to guard me. And what I realized, I mean, within two minutes of this little basketball game, the father was just I mean, he just reeked of alcohol. He slurs his words. If, y'all, if you've been around this, you know what I'm talking about. And he's, he's holding me because he can barely stand. And so he's holding me and he's hitting me. And at a point, I just lost it. Now, this is after I preached a message like I'm preaching to you today. I lost it. And I popped this guy. I said, man, get off of me. Don't hold me anymore. I, I hit him. What happened next, I couldn't have anticipated, but his 15-year-old son was so embarrassed by his father's behavior that he cursed his dad out in front of us and left the field and was left. And the father sobered up for a moment, and he looked shame and 
the whole game stopped at that point. And I, I felt like the biggest failure as a Christian. I dropped to my knees and I started crying. I said, Lord, you called me to be a witness. And look at how I responded. You, you obviously have the wrong guy in the ministry because I'm lousy at this, God. And, you know, my best friend, he hugs me and he says, Philip, you're just a flesh and blood human being like the rest of us. And this doesn't, you know, you, you, you need to leave the ministry over this. You have the right heart over it. But I, I tell you, that afternoon I called my father, who's a pastor, and I said, Dad, I know this has never happened to you, but I, listen, I got in a fight this afternoon and smacked a guy. And, and I don't think I should be. Listen, because I look at the qualifications for a pastor in Timothy and Titus. There's 17, 19 character traits. Not a man given to violence. I, I took that to heart. I said, Lord, I don't, I don't think I'm qualified for this. And my dad said, son, you got to God's not looking for perfect people. He's looking for people that will all, that will just be authentic and they will humble themselves and say they're sorry when they've done the wrong thing. And I share that with you today to say, I don't have it all together. I haven't got all of this figured out. I'm just in the journey like the rest of you. I take two steps forward and three steps back. I fall six times, but I get up a seventh time. That's just the Christian life, isn't it? And I hope by my admission of my guilt, and that's just one of a million things, bless my heart that I could share with you. But I hope that that gives all of us permission to just be real, right? Because I'll tell you one thing that I am certain of after all these years as a Christian in the church. God doesn't want us coming to church putting on a phony church face that acts like we've got it all together. All our lives are crumbling all around us. He, that, that's not what he has for us, right? This is a place where we get to be real. And we give grace as we have received grace. Amen? So we don't want to be braggarts. None of us. Don't brag. If you brag, you're going to get busted eventually. That's what's going to happen. Let's get back to old Gaal who's bragging. and Let's see what happens to him, okay? Verse 30, when Zebel, the ruler of the city, heard the words of Gaal, the son of Ebed, his anger was aroused. And he sent messengers to Abimelech secretly saying, take note, Gaal, the son of Ebed, and his brothers have come to Shechem, and here they are fortifying the city against you. Now, therefore, get up by night, you and the people who are with you, and lie in wait in the field. And it shall be as soon as the sun is up in the morning that you shall rise early and rush upon the city. And when he and the people who are with him come out against you, you may then do to them as you would find opportunity. So he says, be ready in the morning when they're exhausted and hung over. That's a good time to strike, right? Verse 34, so Abimelech and all the people who were with him rose by night. And they lay in wait against Shechem in four companies. When Gaal the son of Ebed went out and stood in the entrance to the city gate, Abimelech and the people who were with him rose from lying in wait. And when Gaal the, saw the people, he said to Zebul, look, people are coming down from the tops of the mountains. But Zebul said to him, you see the shadows of the mountains as if they were men. I mean, that's nothing. That's just that's leaves or something, right? So Gaal spoke again and said, See, no, no, people are coming down from the center of the land, and another company is coming from the diviner's terebinth tree. Then Zebul said to him, Where indeed is your mouth now? With which you said, Who is Abimelech that we should serve him? Are not these the people whom you despise? Go out, if you will, and fight with them now. He kind of forces his hand, doesn't he? So Gaal went out leading the men of Shechem, and fought with Abimelech. And Abimelech chased him, and he fled from, from him, and many fell wounded to the very entrance of the gate. And then Abimelech dwelt at Aruma, and Zebul drove out Gaal and his brothers so that they would not dwell in Shechem. So uh, um, uh, it looks like Zebul kind of pitted these guys against one another to protect his rulership of the city, right? And what you see happening here in the text is 
one group of rotten guys is fighting another group of rotten guys to take care of a whole bunch of rotten guys. And you know, that's how God deals with things sometimes, doesn't he? Sometimes God says, well, I've got a little rotten situation here. Let me use some more rotten people to deal with the rotten situation. I mean, God can use anybody in any situation at all. So let's see what happens in verse 46. Now, when all the men of the tower of Shechem had heard that, they entered the stronghold of the temple of the god Barith. And it was told Abimelech that all the men of the tower of Shechem were gathered together. Then Abimelech went up to Mount Zalman. And he and all the people who were with him and Abimelech took an axe in his hand and cut down a, a, a bough from the trees and, and took it and laid it on his shoulder. Then he said to the people who were with him, what you've seen me do, make haste and do as I've done. So each of the people likewise cut down his own bough and followed Abimelech, put them against the stronghold. And they set the stronghold on fire above them so that all the people of the tower of Shechem died about a thousand men and women. So you got a thousand people that have rushed into this pagan temple to hide because it was probably the only thing in the city that was made of stone or brick. And, and, and so this Abimelech, he has everybody gather firewood. And, and listen, let me put this in perspective. Abimelech probably has family members in this temple. This is his hometown. These are the people that just three years earlier, they're calling each other brother. Right? Their word for brother is our word for cousin. See? Cousin! Yeah, we'd love for you to rule over us. And three years later, Abimelech's got his guys putting kindling, firewood, against this temple so he can burn his relatives alive? What a horrible, horrible thing to read of here, right? Verse 50. Then Abimelech went to Thebes. And he encamped against Thebes and took it. So he's drunk with power. He wants even more, so he's going to attack another city. But there was a strong tower in the city, verse 51, and all the men and women, all the people of the city fled there and shut themselves in. Then they went up to the top of the tower. So Abimelech came as far as the tower and fought against it, and he drew near the door of the tower to burn it, with fire. So he's going to burn these people alive just like he did the last bunch. Verse 53. Everyone say amen if you're still listening. All right. It, it, I, this is wild, right? Verse 53. But a certain woman dropped an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. It's not a warrior. It's just a certain woman that happened to pick up uh, one of those half millstones that they had up there to crush grain. And she thought she was just dropping this over the side to take somebody out. But she took out the king. I mean, clunk. And he goes down, right? But justice has a way of suiting the punishment to the crime. So what do you mean, Pastor Philip? Well, he killed his brothers on one stone. Didn't we read that? It says it twice in the chapter. Now he has one stone dropped on his head. Wow. Kill people on a stone. Die with a stone dropped on your head. Do you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane? This is not in my notes. It just came to me. The Garden of Gethsemane when probably 300 temple police came to arrest Jesus. And Peter draws his short sword, probably about a 16, 18 inch sword from his side. And he's trying to swing at one of those temple police. And he takes off one of the servant's ears. And Jesus performs his last miracle, uh, a, a Christian misusing a sword. You ever misuse God's word to hurt somebody? He takes the ear, he puts it back on the servants. The last miracle he performs before he goes to be beaten all night and then crucified the next day. He, he heals a man, right? But the words that he said to Peter, Peter, put down your sword. Those who live by the sword shall perish by the sword, right? What you do to others will come back to you one day, right? We see here in this passage once again 
the, the law of sowing and reaping. What you send out, you will one day get back. And the curse of Jotham is fulfilled. God repaid the wickedness. God returned the evil on their own heads. So to make a positive application for you today, don't send out a bunch of bad stuff. Don't plant a bunch of bad stuff. Plant good things and you'll harvest good things, right? Nobody wants a millstone dropped on their head, right? Well, let's see what happens next. Then he called quickly to the young man, his armor bearer, and said to him, draw your sword and kill me, lest men say of me a woman killed him. That's, that's pride, isn't it? I don't want anybody to say that a girl beat me up. That's so, that, and isn't that the way history remembers this guy? A certain woman dropped a millstone on his, that's the way we remember it, right? He said, kill me. I don't want anybody to say a woman killed me. So, he, so his young man thrust him through and he died. And when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed, every man to his place. Thus God repaid the wickedness of Abimelech, which he had done to his father by killing his 70 brothers. And all the evil of the men of Shechem God returned on their own heads, and on them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jerubbabel. And after Abimelech, there arose to save Israel, Tola. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of Tola before I read about it. Just a few people, right? The son of Pua, the son of Dodo. That's a name, isn't it? A man of Issachar, and he dwelt in Shamir, in the mountains of Ephraim. He judged Israel 23 years, and he died and was buried in Shamir. And after him arose Jer, a Gileadite, and he judged Israel 22 years. He had 45 years of peace in the land. Now he had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys. They also had 30 towns, which are called Havoth Jer to this day, which are in the land of Gilead. And Jer died and was buried in Cameron. So what are we to take from these verses? We get fearful over who's elected in office for four years here in America, don't we? Oh, the one I voted for was not elected. Oh, what's going to happen? In four? What if they're reelected and they get two terms, eight years? Ah. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And he turns it like a channel of water this way or that, doesn't he? Right? Here we see two guys. One reigns rules for 23 years, another for 22 years. The, the, the last guy, he's got 30 sons that were governors over all these towns. But nobody knew who they were before I read their names just a moment ago. Right? But these guys are mentioned in the book of books. God, God put their names in the Bible. Right? What's the point that I'm trying to make here? Well, there are people in this world that are trying to leave their mark on the world. They want to be remembered. They want to make some sort of a lasting impression on planet Earth, right? And do you know how few people are remembered beyond their generation? If I were to ask you who was the pop star in 1929, could you tell me? Right? And, and, and is it, there's something to take to heart here. Uh, you know, Lady Gaga... No one's going to remember Lady Gaga in a very short amount of time, right? Justin Bieber. Uh, any of you Bieberites out there? <laughs> John Bartzopoulos, a Bieberite. <laughs> Instead of leaving your mark on this world, make all the difference in your family and leave your mark on the next world. It doesn't matter that nobody knows who Gilbert Prinsley is. It really doesn't. But my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I'm trying to be the husband and the father that God has called me to be. And I'm trying to be the pastor that he's called me to be. And I recognize that 10 years, 20 years, 30 years after I'm gone, nobody's going to be speaking my name in a good or a bad way. But all of heaven will be changed because of my life because I've tried to live my life for Jesus Christ. This is you're trying to do so, right? Live your life not trying to, to make a mark on this world, but on the next world. Well, verse 6, Then the children of Israel 
did again did evil in the sight of the Lord. You know, oops, they did it again, right? And served the Baals and the Ashtoreths, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the people of Ammon, the gods of the Philistines, and they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. So now they're just they're just going wild with every pagan god from every people group around them. So the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the people of Ammon. And from that year, they harassed and oppressed the children of Israel for 18 years. All the children of Israel who were on the other side of the Jordan in the land of, of the Amorites in Gilead. Moreover, the people of Ammon crossed over the Jordan to fight against Judah also, against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was severely distressed. Say that with me, severely distressed. Do you know what that means in Hebrew? It means they were severely distressed. <laughs> For 18 years, they're just kind of getting pummeled, right? Because of all of this idolatry taking place in their life and in their hearts. Verse 10, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord saying, we've sinned against you because we have both forsaken our God and served the Baals. So the Lord said to the children of Israel, did I not deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and from the people of Ammon and from the Philistines, also the Sidonians, the Amalekites, Mayanites, uh, when they oppressed you? And you cried out to me and I delivered you from their hand, yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will deliver you no more. Go and cry out to the gods which you have chosen. And let them deliver you in your time of distress. Oh my goodness. They're crying out in repentance again. It doesn't say they've put away all their gods yet, right? See, no doubt the last generation said, oh, well, listen, when it gets really bad, this, this is what you pray to God. You ever done that? You pray the right words, but it's not really coming from your heart. You don't own those words, right? You're just praying the right words because you know they're the right words to pray. And what you're really saying is, God, I, if I say the right thing, will you relieve the pressure right now? Right? Because I can't handle much more pressure. But I'm not really ready to repent yet. I just don't like how bad things are right now. And you know what God says to that? He says, hey, don't cry to me. Cry to your own gods. Cry to the gods that you've put before me. If money is your God, put it in a big pile bow down and start praying to it. See what happens. If material possessions, if that's your God, pray to him. If you are your own God, right? You do what you want to do and don't ever ask God what he wants you to do. Uh, leave church today. If I go into the bathroom where there's a nice big mirror, turn the light on and look yourself in the eye and say, oh, please, me, deliver me. And just see how that works out, right? God says, listen, you keep running off to these gods that I've tried to rescue you from. I mean, you just, it, don't cry out to me, cry out to them. I'll tell you what, God will do what is necessary to wake us up to the truth. In 2004, that's when Hurricane Katrina hit, right? Now, I'm in Nashville. I'm, I'm in Tennessee at the time. I don't really know much about hurricanes. Hadn't lived around places like you guys have here. I knew nothing about that. But I saw on CNN, Franklin Graham was talking about how devastated New Orleans was and that they needed chaplains to go with the Billy Graham evangelistic organization to, to, to minister to people and comfort people. And it stirred my heart. And I said, God, if I could be of any help at all, I pray that you'd open a door. The next day, I got an email from Joe Foch in Calvary Chapel, uh, Philadelphia. He's very good, close friends with Franklin Graham. He said the need is so great in New Orleans that any Calvary Chapel pastor that will go to New Orleans, they'll pay your airfare, they'll put you up, they'll, they'll take care of all your expenses if you'll just go and minister to the people because we know that Calvary Chapel pastors are spirit-filled men of the word. I couldn't believe it. I told Tammy, I said, I'm, I think I'm going to New Orleans. 
So I called Calvary Philly. They said, yeah, we'll wire a ticket. And on Halloween, I flew into New Orleans. And I'm telling you what, this was five weeks after Hurricane Katrina. And it was like one of those end of the world movies. We drove for 30, maybe 45 minutes and didn't see a sign of life. I mean, brand new shopping malls and Walmarts and auto dealerships. And I mean, no sign of life, just everything just abandoned. And when we get there, I uh, requested to be put in the worst place. <laughs> That's why, I, you know, I didn't know what I was saying. Right? So they took me to St. Bernard Parish. And when I went into St. Bernard Parish, the, the uh, EPA and the military were there. They had on gas masks and chemicals. And everything is covered in some sort of a white film. It was just the creepiest thing. They only let us into St. Bernard Parish because we were with chaplains with Billy Graham, right? And they said, uh, just help people carry groceries to their cars or their trailers or whatever they have. And I said, well, where are the groceries coming from? They said churches from all over the United States at their own expense are renting trucks and trailers and bringing things to the people. Right? I, I'm telling you what. In a, in a catastrophe, it's the Christians that show up. I didn't see one atheist trailer down there giving food out. I'm telling you. And you know, I even prayed with a few atheists. I did. And about 50 people a day, we would counsel. We would put our hand on their shoulder. How are you holding up? And they would begin to share their story. Well, I lost my wife. I lost one of my children. I lost this. I lost that. Do you know that none of them, none of them was just wanting to get back what they lost. At the time, I remember hearing um, Joel Osteen. Some of you probably listened to Joel. He was talking about how we're just praying for the people in New Orleans that they could get back twice as much as they lost. And, and, and it sounded so superficial to me being in the midst of it. Why? Because the people that lost everything, it's like they were awakened to the futility of living for material possessions and all of that. They, they, they weren't just wanting their stuff back. They realized how quickly you can lose everything. I'm telling you what, there were people that were coming to Christ. It, it, it was an amazing, I mean, I, I, after the first day, I was there for a week, after the first day I had to go behind one of these FEMA trailers and just weep over the devastation, over the loss of life that took place there. There were people that said, listen, we were all living for the wrong stuff. I'm not angry at God for what's happened here. He had to wake us up to what's really important. Guys, some of you, the difficulties that happen in your life, the difficulties that happen in my life, God uses those to say, wake up. You're serving gods that cannot help you in your crisis. Wake up and put those idols away and serve me with your whole heart. Don't just pray for the pressure to be relieved for a few minutes. Let him be Lord of all. Let him be Lord of all. In this instance, after 18 years of severe distressed situations, they finally cry out, and God says, hey, cry out to your own gods. Pray to them. But I love how this chapter ends. Because you see the heart of our God. He's a loving God. You understand that, don't you? The God of the Old Testament, he is a loving God. Look with me, verse 15. And the children of Israel said to the Lord, we've sinned. Exclamation point, we've sinned. Do to us whatever seems best to you. Only deliver us this day, we pray. That's people putting their lives back in the hands of God. Lord, do whatever you got to do to me. But, but. Help, help me, right? That's what all of the people were saying. Verse 16, so they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord. And this is my favorite part of the passage here. And his soul could no longer endure the misery of Israel. Then the people of Ammon gathered together and encamped in Gilead and the children of Israel assembled together and encamped at Mizpah and all, and the people, the leaders of Gilead, said to one another, Who's the man who will begin to fight against the people of Ammon? He'll be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. 
what happens here is the people finally put away all of the wrong stuff and start serving the Lord. I don't know who this word is for. And some of you here today, you want to serve the Lord, but you won't put away the wrong stuff. That's not true repentance. True repentance is to hate what God hates, right? And to love what God loves. If God calls it sin, you and I, we need to, we need to turn from it. We need to put it away. To put away all of the wrong stuff and to serve the Lord. It says he couldn't stand their misery anymore. I love that part of the verse. It's my favorite verse in today's Bible study second half of a verse because our God he is a father listen I know some of you have not had good fathers I, you have a heavenly father and he loves you so much his heart breaks at your misery he's weeping over the entanglements in your life and in this passage, it's like God said, oh, I can't take it anymore. I can't take their suffering anymore. I've, I've got to rescue them. Again. I know I've rescued them a million times, but I've got to do it again because I can't bear to see them like this anymore. Guys, if you haven't figured it out yet, you and me, we're the people that keep running off to other gods, aren't we? I mean, if you would look at your Bible like a school yearbook, I'm looking for pictures of me. Oh, I wasn't smiling there. Ooh, yeah, like that look pretty good there, right? You're looking for pictures of yourself in this book. You and I, we're the ones that keep running away from God to other gods, to other idols. And when we realize it and when we turn from them, when we put all this stuff away and we begin to serve him from our hearts once again, it's like tears from heaven falling upon us and we feel him weeping as a father weeps over his children. Oh, I hate how you keep hurting yourself. I hate all the stuff that keeps happening to you, but now that you're turning from it, I can't bear it anymore and I, I'm, go I'm going to rescue you again. And guys, that's the hope that we have as Christians that read and believe every word of the Bible. He always rescues no matter what you have done, no matter how far you've gone from him, no matter how many times you've stumbled and fallen, he forgives, he forgives, he forgives. And listen, I know that today in the world we have some sins and entanglements that we think are too big for God to forgive. What a foolish notion that is. To think that, that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for all the sins of mankind, it is so infinitely more valuable in repayment for all sins. There is nothing you can do. Nothing you can do that would separate you from the love of your God. All you've got to do is just join God against yourself. Quit trying to candy coat it. You know, we call everything an addiction today, don't we? Call it what God calls it. I've sinned against you, Lord. I've sinned against you and I'm grieved over it and I don't want to do this anymore. I'm putting all that junk away. Today, I'm giving you my heart again. I want to return to my first love for you. Lord, fill me with your spirit. Forgive me and help me. Do you know that when you pray that kind of prayer, he always hears. He always. I had been running from the call to the ministry for almost 14 years. 14 years. I'd been kicked out of the Air Force for drugs. I'd been pursuing a music thing. So Tammy and I, we were just like roommates. We passed each other in the hall of our little home. Didn't really have anything to say to each other. I'd made a mess of everything. And do you know the prayer that I prayed that day? I had prayed many times before that day. But I'd never prayed it the right way. It was always just trying to relieve a little pressure. But I wasn't ready to give up my gods and serve him wholly. But the day that we got in this fight, and I, 
Tammy was holding Lucy on his hand. And we acknowledged we didn't love each other. We didn't even really like each other. And she said, who are you? What happened to the man that I thought I married? And I'd lost myself along the way. And that's what happens when you serve other gods for a while. And she walked in the house and, uh, and I had that last identity crisis that changed everything. I said, God, I have no clue who I am anymore. Not a clue. But Lord, I'll go anywhere and I'll do anything if you would just restore the joy of my salvation. I just feel so dirty and empty. And Oh, Lord, please help me. And he couldn't bear my misery. He heard my prayer that day. He changed my life. Guys, it was like waking up from a bad dream. I remember saying, ah, it's over. All of this uh, pushing water uphill futility that was my life, right? It was, it was, I just woke up. It's like, ah, he's given me the joy of my salvation back. And with it, he said, I'm calling you for the fourth time now, big guy, to be a pastor. And that day I said, yes. I'll go anywhere and I'll do anything. I walked into our little house. I said, Danny, I'm going to be a pastor. <laughs> and she said, what the bleep? No, she did not. I'm just kidding. <laughs> she didn't cause she had a good reason to, I'm telling you. She looked at me with shock, like, who is this guy? You know what? Right? But listen, God can't handle our misery. If you would just turn from everything, oh, you can wake up from your bad dream that you're in the middle of right now. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for anyone here today that if not yet totally surrendered their life to you, Lord, I pray that you would speak into their hearts right now and set them free from their past, Lord. Set them free from their sins. Set them free from their idolatry, Lord. I pray for every person present today, Lord, that you would bear their misery no more and you would rescue them. Lord, in the event there's someone in our midst today and they're suffering and they're hurting and they're desperate for an answer, Lord, I pray that you would speak to their heart right now. That they would just confess their sin to you. They would acknowledge that Jesus is your son and the answer to their sin. And they would receive him as Savior, Rescuer, and Lord, and Master. Lord, help them to pray that prayer from their hearts right now. And set them free. Lord, the rest of us, as we begin to worship now, I pray that you would strip away everything in our lives that displease you and draw us back to the foot of the cross once again. And Lord, as we contemplate your death and your death meant life to us, Lord, we pray that we would proclaim your death until you come by taking the Lord's Supper today. That we would examine our hearts before you Resurrender everything so that we would leave this service today in proper standing with you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Won't you stand to your feet? I'll be down at the front if you need prayer. I'd love to pray with you this morning. But you just worship the Lord through the first song, and as the second song begins to play and you're confessed up and resurrendered, then you can come to the Lord's table and take of the cup and of the bread. Let's worship.